We're also uh, looking at the intensity. Of course, there's more than that. We're going to start looking now at some of the uh, tools you've got in the package there. Again, we've got a ton of slides in this one. Let's look at location, quality, and frequency. We looked at that neural matrix model, remember I talked about the sensory discriminative aspect, and that includes things like intensity, location, quality, frequency, that sort of thing. So if we're just asking about intensity, we're really only getting sort of one, one aspect of that sensory discriminative domain. It's possible that other components um, may also change before intensity. So if all I was doing was using pain intensity to measure change over time, it's possible that that stays consistent, but maybe it's less frequent. Right? Maybe the quality of it has changed from a burning stab to sort of a dull ache. I don't know, is that good or bad? Hard to say, I suppose. But it's possible that some of these things have actually changed. Maybe the pain used to go all the way down my arm to my, you know, my lateral two and a, or one and a half fingers, and now it's, you know, now it's more up in my shoulder. You know, so the location has changed. So really, we should think about measuring other aspects of this sensory discriminative component than just intensity. And they don't need to necessarily be difficult either. Um, I, I would think that the additional components are going to provide some greater treatment uh, decision guidance here. You see what I mean as we go forward. And I will say this, that every time I analyze, say, um, something like neck-related disability, neck pain-related disability, and um, I don't know how I do, but you know, we use all these different statistical models, pain intensity usually is, is left in there. So there's a relationship between intensity and disability. But Location, so the amount, the number of areas on the body also stays in there, and it's not uncommon that frequency also is retained in those models. And what that means, in, in simple terms, is that those things are telling us something different. They're not all just telling us the same thing about the pain experience, but that they're telling us something different enough that statistically they're adding some kind of meaningful understanding of this patient's disability. So it's worth our while to, to capture some of these things. Pain location. Um, You've got in your package, the uh, clinical pain assessment tools, a body diagram that I use if I need a paper one. I will admit that it's not the best diagram out there, but it's one of the better ones that I've been able to find. Yeah, if you take a look at it, um, first of all, what I've tried to do, I actually adapted this from somewhere. Uh, I can no longer find where I had gotten this originally, like five years ago, so I can't give credit where it's due, but I, I basically took an image that was just showing uh, front, back, and one side, and it was clearly a female. So what I've done is I've gone and manipulated that, so I've tried to make it a little bit more androgynous, um, and I've added right and left views, uh, because the original one I had didn't have that. What I do, I, I will use this, if I want to use this from research purposes, I can actually use this to quantify uh, the number of areas, and what I tell is if anyone who fills in a square at least halfway, I'm going to count that as one square. Or they'll put X's in the square and I just count the number of X's. Okay. I also find that this one of any of the tools that I use is one of the best for guiding my subsequent clinical assessment. Because I get this picture, I can see where they've indicated the areas that they're experiencing pain. I can take a look at the sort of the you know the behavior of the pain, is it radiating, is it shooting, things like that. Um, you can go ahead if you want and ask them, sometimes you give them different colors and say red is pain, blue is numb, you know, uh, uh, yellow is zapping or tingling, that sort of thing. And you can actually start to get a sense of the different types of experiences that they're having. And so that might lead me into specific evaluations. It looks like there's some kind of ridiculous, you know, ridiculopathy or something here. And so I'm going to have to specifically evaluate that. Um, this, I will say that the body diagram, a body diagram, whether it's this one or another one, is part of my routine package that I give to, to uh, patients when they come into the clinic. So I have a little package that includes about four or five different scales. This is one of them. And it says routine, fill this out for me, I get a lot of information off of that. There are some really interesting online ones, and I'm going to share those with you here uh, in a few minutes. Uh, to the pain and quality, Pain quality assessment scale. This is a scale um, that is relatively new in measurement terms. I think it was maybe 07, 08, something like that, that it was first published. 
If you take a look at this scale, it's a series of 0 to 10 scales. And they're all looking, offering um, questions about different qualities of the pain. So you can take a look. It's, it's a little bit longer, slightly on the long side. But once again, it's fortunately, there's just a bunch of 0 to 10 scales. So they're easy to interpret. As a clinician, this is something that you could present to a patient. And then when they're done, get it back and just go through and look at the pattern of their responses. This isn't one that you have to sum up or anything like that. You don't get a summary scale necessarily here. There is a summary score that you can get, but it's not overly useful clinically as far as I'm concerned. But you can look at the individual responses and go, wow, you scored really high on you know, cold or numbing or something like that, or freezing, whatever that term is that they use. Um, this is telling me something. Or you haven't scored high on any of these stabbing, tingling, burning sensations. This is leading me away from this idea that there might be a neuropathic problem. Okay. So the idea of the pain quality assessment scale is that it's meant to be more telling for people who might have neuropathic problems or neuropathic component to their pain. So if you think that's the case, you may even give this, this is one that you might give sort of after the assessment. You go, okay, so this person has described to me a whole bunch of these sort of really bizarre symptoms. I'd like to track some of these over time. So, okay, just before you leave today, I apologize, can I get you just fill out just one last scale? Or take this home with you and bring it back to you next time you come. Because I just do, I want to have some numbers in here. I want to have some kind of quantification on this so that we can follow over time. Okay. And then over from that, uh, the next scale in, in the line there should be the short form McGill pain questionnaire. Has anyone, does anyone use the McGill? Has anyone used it? Here, no. I'm not surprised. Anytime I ask that question, very few people uh, will say that they do. The full McGill pain questionnaire is a rather long and involved tool. And it's somewhat difficult to score. But the short form McGill, if you take a look at that, um, it's really not all that challenging. Right? So the patient goes through and they indicate the magnitude of their experience of these different symptoms. If you take a look at um, numbers 1 through 11, all fit within the sensory discriminative component of the pain. Items 12 through 15 fit within that motivational affective domain. This scale was created by Ron Pelzak of the Neurometrics Theory as, a, as an attempt to capture these different domains of the pain experience. You can use this sometimes as a sort of quick, almost screen test. Uh, they've scored really low on these cognitive, evaluative, you know, and motivational side, of, or the affective side of things, so I'm not really concerned about that. I don't feel like I need to further investigate that. But they're quite high on some of these sensory discriminative components. So you can use this a little bit as a quick screen that way, and you should uh, you record your score um, individually if you chose some components. It also will have, as, you, as you'll see, it also has a visual analog scale, and it also has a, um, a present pain intensity which offers um, descriptors. One of the interesting things about this, one of the things I like about this actually, is if you look at the descriptor scale, the bottom one I think is excruciating. Maybe that's a good anchor for a 10. All right, so this is something that, you know, Melzak, who's thought even more about this than I have, for sure, no question about it, um, has decided that excruciating is like the top level. So maybe that's a nice little anchor for a 10. Okay. One of the things that I also like about these scales, in particular the McGill um, and the pain quality assessment score, is that it offers the ability to sort of calibrate the discussion a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, pain kind of lacks a good language. But by using some of the descriptors on those scales, then the patient can come in and say, I fill out that scale, and yeah, my pain definitely is burning shooting or stabbing or whatever. And you can sort of, you can have some conversation now, um, see what they mean by that, right? But it offers a little bit of an ability to calibrate that discussion.